Good morning. This is Dave Meinhardt from the Vatacuti Foundation and here in suburban Detroit. This is the second of three webinars in the Gynecologic Oncology Series. Today, Dr. Krishnansu Tiwari will be presenting ovarian cancers, epithelial tumors of the pelvis. Dr. Tiwari is an associate professor for the Division of Gynecologic Oncology, Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology for the University of California, Irvine. He also practices as an obstetrician gynecologist in Orange, California, and is affiliated with multiple hospitals in the area, including Lakewood Regional Medical Center and Long Beach Memorial Medical Center. Some of his accomplishments include listings in America's Top Doctors, Best Doctors in America, and other international and local honors. For those of you new to the GoToWebinar system, I want to let you know that it may take a few moments to switch between participants. There is a control panel on the right side of your screen which may have messages from time to time for you to read. Later, if you have questions for Dr. Tawari, we will ask you to type them in the box at the bottom where it says chat. If time permits, we will send them to Dr. Tawari at the end of the webinar. Also joining us is Dr. Mahendra Bandari, CEO of the Vatikuti Foundation and the Director of Robotic Surgery Education and Research for the Vatikuti Urology Institute in Detroit for the Henry Ford Health System. He is joining us from his home in suburban Detroit. Good morning to both of you. Dr. Bandari, please go ahead. Thank you, Dave. Uh, uh, at the very outset, I must thank Dr. Tiwari, despite his extremely busy and nagging schedule, he accepted our invitation, as he has been doing for past several years at the request of the Vadikudi Foundation. Uh, most of you would know Dr. Tiwari, but, uh, and Dave has given a, a fairly sketchy uh, invitation for an introduction to Dr. Tiwari. I have known Dr. Tiwari uh, for the last few years and he had been a great friend of the, he is a great friend of the foundation. Dr. Tiwari is one of the most accomplished gynecological oncologists, at least I know of, I know quite a few. And Dr. Tiwari, uh, besides being uh, an excellent and outstanding surgeon, which we have seen in action during several visits to India, is a first-class researcher and uh, he has done some seminal work and recently published work of role of uh, bevacizum for advanced and metastatic cervical cancer where he has shown that significantly they have increased the survival of these patients which had no hope to rehash the same platinum-based chemotherapy which anyway would not show significant effect after radiation therapy which these patients had. Uh, Krishnanshu, for you to know, is so dedicated to academics that uh, West Coast, it is around 5 o'clock in the morning, but he has taken the call to talk to you guys. Without uh, being much uh, between you and Dr. Tiwari, I'm looking forward to hear from him. Today, we have chosen a subject for him, which is ovarian cancers, and it's recently renomenclated as epithelial tumors of the renal pelvis. So, over to Krishnan Tiwari. Good morning, or I don't know, it's probably late afternoon or early evening in India. Um, I want to thank Dr. Bhandari on behalf of the Vadi Kudi Foundation to have invited me to participate in this webinar. It's a real honor to do anything for the Vatikuti Foundation, which does so much great work um, for uh, physicians in India. And uh, the, my career highlight has always, um, and probably always will be, when I started coming to India on behalf of the Vatikuti Foundation to um, conduct robotic surgery fellowships or workshops in um, various cities, uh, Kogi Laban Hospital in Mumbai, Apollo in Kolkata, Apollo Hospital in Delhi, as well as um, Manal um, uh, Medical Institute and University Medical Center in Bengaluru. So um, being given this invitation to do um, a webinar, I jumped at it because everything um, done through the Vatikuti Foundation has just been very educational and um, 
I, I, it's just a real privilege to be asked. So anyways, I'm going to survey the therapeutic landscape in advanced ovarian cancer. I, um, ovarian cancer is a very important um, field for us. It does not have very many robotic surgical applications at this point, but um, it, uh, it very well may in the future. Part of the reason for that is, as you can see in this, this photograph of an advanced case, ovarian cancer spreads throughout the abdomen and pelvis and requiring simultaneous access to all quadrants of the abdominal cavity, which we don't readily um, have with ro current robotics. But it's an important area to um, work on in terms of drug development, and that's what I'm going to focus on this morning. So there's four different, um, or maybe probably five different main categories of ovarian cancer, the most common being the high-grade serous cancers. You can see in this slide, mucinous cancers, endometroid cancers, clear cell carcinomas uh, comprise the remainder, as well as low-grade serous cancers. The most important thing to recognize about the high-grade cancers is that they have homologous recombination deficiencies. And what this means is that, uh, as you probably know, patients who have BRCA mutations, um, BRCA1 or BRCA2, they are unable to repair double-strand DNA breaks. And we know that uh, PARP inhibitors, which prevent patients from repairing single-strand breaks, um, are active in these patients. But what we've also learned is that there is a BRCA nest phenomenon in that patients who do not have BRCA mutations they also respond to many of the um, drugs that patients that have BRCA positive cancers respond to, and that's because of homologous recombination deficiency. And we'll be talking about that a little bit more um, as I move along. These are the controversial topics um, in treating newly diagnosed advanced ovarian cancer. For the first um, part of this webinar, I'm going to talk about newly diagnosed cases. Then we'll also talk about um, patients with recurrent disease. So neoadjuvant chemotherapy, weekly chemotherapy using a dose-dense schedule for paclitaxel, combined intraperitoneal and intravenous chemotherapy, as well as adding bevacizumab, which as you know is an anti-angiogenesis agent. So let's go through some of the clinical trials and some of the data. In terms of recurrent ovarian cancer, um, Unfortunately, despite our um, best efforts and aggressive cytoreductive procedures that we perform, most patients will re experience recurrence, and this is even among those patients who respond initially to platinum paclitaxel-based chemotherapy. If we're talking mainly about the high-grade serous cancers, which is really the focus of this um, discussion today, um, most of these recurrence will be detected by rises in the CA125. Classically, we just um, divide recurrences into those that are platinum refractory and resistant, as well as those that are platinum sensitive. And just so you know, this is really an arbitrary designation. Um, it really has no clear biologic rationale. But certainly, patients who don't even respond to your initial therapy um, are unable to put into remission. They are platinum refractory. Uh, those patients who go into remission but experience tumor regrowth within six months of platinum, we consider them resistant. And then, of course, those who um, have regrowth greater than six months after platinum-based combination therapy are considered platinum sensitive. So this is a um, nice timeline um, looking at recurrent ovarian cancer and some of the themes I just spoke about. If you notice um, the last two lines, uh, we actually um, have now gone further and separated the platinum sensitive patients into the patients that are partially or potentially platinum sensitive, which is six to 12 month recurrence, and then the patients that are extremely platinum sensitive, those who relapse um, beyond 12 months. And this slide like this um, provides us with the therapeutic rationale um, for which to uh, provide treatment guidance. For example, patients that are platinum refractory, they may be candidates for hospice or better yet, clinical trials. Certainly platinum while platinum resistant, while, platinum resistant while there are a number of drugs that have been approved by the United States Food and Drug Administration that can be used, 
in this group of patients, really, they really should also go on to clinical trials. Partially platinum sensitive is where I've moved some of the um, new uh, drug approvals to. And then, of course, patients that are platinum sensitive um, and who've relapsed 12 months or longer, not only should they be considered candidates for retreatment with platinum, but also they should be evaluated for secondary cytoreductive surgery. So these are the treatment considerations and goals for patients with recurrent ovarian cancer. If you look at um, disease-free interval, that's important, as well as existing toxicities from frontline therapy. The volume of the disease at time of relapse, as well as serologic relapse, or what we call biochemical recurrences, are very important in terms of the CA125. Therefore, the primary goals for patients who have retreatment or recurrent disease is progression-free survival because they cannot be cured, increased survival time, prevention of symptoms, palliation of symptoms, and of course, quality of life. This is a survey of approved drugs in um, ovarian cancer in the United States, beginning back in 1964 with malphalan, anthracyclines were approved in 74, platinum drugs were approved in the 70s and 80s, hexalin, which um, functions like an alkylator, paclitaxel, 92, topotecan, pegylated liposomal doxorubicin, gemcitabine approved with carboplatin based only on PFS, um, in, interestingly. And then there was an eight-year gap, and then finally last year we received two approvals, bevacizumab in combination with different chemotherapies, as well as olaparib in the fourth-line um, space. So we, do, we have a kind of a lot of drugs, but not a lot of very interesting drugs, with the latter two approvals being most important as they represent targeted therapy. As I said earlier, we use the platinum refractory resistant and platinum sensitive paradigm to help dis, um, us guide therapy. And again, it, although this slide doesn't say it's suggested, I really would encourage most patients with platinum refractory and resistant disease to go on to clinical trials testing novel agents. And then, of course, if you're platinum sensitive, a chemotherapy doublet, ba platinum based doublet, of course, with or without bevacizumab is the correct um, uh, treatment paradigm. Let's compare first-line treatment with that of recurrent disease. First-line treatment, convenience and toxicity is less important because we're going for a cure. Only one out of five women probably can be cured of this disease because it presents with advanced stage in most situations, but um, Certainly, I think most patients will accept inconvenience in schedule as well as um, relatively high toxicology in order to possibly be one of those one in five patients. Um, patients with recurrent disease who are incurable, by definition, uh, the goal is more palliation. Um, those, these patients are going to accept less toxicity, and convenience is much more important in terms of quality of life. These are um, the therapeutic and pivotal clinical trials I'd like to review, and this is concerning anti-angiogenesis therapy. Remember, I did tell you that um, some of the important research questions are intraperitoneal chemotherapy, weekly dose dense paclitaxel, anti-angiogenesis therapy, PARP inhibitors, immunotherapy. These are some of the important topics, and these are the therapeutic and pivotal clinical trials. We've had eight positive phase three randomized trials in which the primary endpoint was met. These are in, um, these are eight trials involving anti-angiogenesis drugs. You can see bevacizumab was studied in four of them. GOG218 and ICON7 studied bevacizumab, albeit at different doses, 15 milligrams per kilogram in 218 and 7.5 milligrams per kilogram in ICON7 for newly diagnosed advanced disease. Ocean studied the combination of carbopaclitaxel with or without uh, bevacizumab for patients with platinum-sensitive recurrent disease. Aurelia studied bevacizumab in combination with either dose-dense weekly paclitaxel, single-agent pegylated liposomal doxorubicin, or with topotecan in the platinum-resistant space. 
All four of these trials are positive. The Aurelia trial leading to regulatory approval in the United States for bevacizumab for the first time for ovarian cancer. However, GOG 218 and ICON 7, um, 218 mainly led to European medicines approval of the drug in combination with chemotherapy in Europe. However, only the 7.5 milligram dose that was studied in ICON 7 you know, was uh, is approved for reimbursement in Europe. Well, moving on, we had four additional trials looking at novel, other novel antiangiogenesis agents in um, ovarian cancer. The AGO OVAR 16 trial looked at pazopinib as a maintenance therapy. Um, ICON 6 looked at sidirinib. Now, pazopinib and sidirinib are oral small molecule tyrosine kinase inhibitors, and interestingly, ICON 6 was the only of these eight trials to also show an overall survival advantage. Um, both the Pazopinib, uh, excuse me, the Pazopinib study was presented, I believe, in ASCO uh, two years ago. ICON-6 was presented at ESMO in 2000. One study looking at Tadinib in frontline therapy. Uh, this was presented at the ESGO meeting, European Society for Gynecologic Oncology, that was held in Liverpool in 2013. And then we had the TRANOVA-1 study looking at trabaninib. Um, trabaninib is an interesting antiangiogenesis drug because it is the only one of these five drugs that does not um, act along the VEGF um, axis. This um, drug targets the ang angiopoietin axis, interfering with the ability of the TI2 receptor to bind its ligand ANG1 and or ANG2. All eight of these trials have met their primary endpoint, which was PFS with ICON-6 also showing an OS advantage. In a subpopulation of high-risk patients in ICON-7, those that were suboptimally developed stage 3 as well as stage 4 patients, there is a OS survival advantage with bevacizumab. We have one antiangiogenesis study that met its um, secondary endpoint, GOG Protocol 213. This was a study that looked at the um, incorporation of bevacizumab for platinum sensitive disease. The difference between this and OCEANS, however, is that GOG213 is also asking a question regarding secondary cytoreduction. Overall survival is the primary endpoint for 213, which it just barely did not meet, but it did meet its PFS endpoint. And the issue is as to whether secondary cytoreduction as survival benefit is ongoing in this trial. Moving on with our therapeutic and clinical pivotal trials, let's look at intraperitoneal chemotherapy. GOG-172 is actually the third phase three intravenous intraperitoneal clinical trial that showed a positive survival endpoint that the GOG has um, conducted. The first trial, of course, was GOG-104, which showed a survival advantage but was criticized because it was published in 1996, the same year that um, GOG-111 that brought us paclitaxel was published. And the criticism for GOG-104 was that although with intraperitoneal chemotherapy, survival was improved, GOG-104 did not include paclitaxels, which is where the field had moved towards. So the second trial, GOG-114, was um, published about four or five years later in 2001. And this study did include paclitaxels. It did show a survival advantage, but again, it fell under criticism because the investigational arm that included intraperitoneal chemotherapy also had a dose escalation of the carboplatin to an AUC of 9 intravenously. So many people who read that trial said that the survival advantage in the investigational arm had nothing to do with the intraperitoneal therapy, but was rather a function of the intravenous component of the investigational arm in which carboplatin had been dosed escalated. GOG-172 then was published in 2006 by Armstrong from, Deb Armstrong from Johns Hopkins University, and this included taxanes. There was no dose escalation of carboplatin, but it was very toxic um, using 
intraperitoneal cisplatin and intraperitoneal paclitaxel. Um, it turned out it was very toxic and only 40% of patients completed all six cycles. But the survival advantage was remarkable. It has fallen under criticism because of the schedule. The way the schedule is given is paclitaxel is administered um, intravenously on day one. Day two is intraperitoneal cisplatin. And then because um, they wanted to study intraperitoneal paclitaxel in this study, paclitaxel was given intraperitoneally a week later on day eight. The reason to also give, it, give paclitaxel IV was because it's such a large molecule and many people felt that paclitaxel wouldn't be absorbed sufficiently from the intraperitoneal space and therefore systemic levels would fall. But as a result of giving IV paclitaxel on day one followed by IP paclitaxel on day eight, many people think that the improvement in survival was related to the dose density schedule um, by giving the paclitaxel weekly like that. So, um, we are back to the drawing board with intraperitoneal chemotherapy. My brother, um, Devansu Tiwari, um, recently published a long-term survival analysis looking at GOG-172 along with patients treated on the, immediately, the trial immediately preceding it, GOG-114, if you remember, in which uh, the carboplatin dose was escalated. But he showed um, significant long-term survival in these patients, and this was published in the Journal of Clinical Oncology um, just a few months ago, and I encourage you to pull that paper. Right now, we're waiting for six more events, it's actually maybe five more events at this point, in GOG 252. This is looking at intravenous intraperitoneal carbo versus intravenous intraperitoneal cisplatin versus IV um, treatment. And this trial is almost mature, and um, we're looking forward to these results. Importantly, um, some people have predicted that this trial is going to be negative because all three of these arms include bevacizumab. So um, we um, are, are looking forward to hearing about this trial. HIPEC is also um, an important consideration when we're talking about intraperitoneal chemotherapy, and this stands for heated intraoperative chemotherapy for epithelial ovarian cancer, or not, um, I don't know if, I don't think actually the EC is, stands for epithelial ovarian cancer because it's used for um, pseudomyxoma and other diseases, but in any event, heated intraperitoneal or intraoperative chemotherapy at the time of cytoreductive surgery. We do not have any phase three studies on this. There are some phase two studies out there. Um, at UC Irvine, one of my colleagues, Dr. Leslie Randall, is conducting a phase one study. Uh, I think HIPEC is promising. It involves using heated chemotherapy, um, heated to approximately 41 degrees, to help denature the proteins and expose the double helical DNA backbone so that platinum, which forms typically platinum DNA addicts, can have easier access to the DNA. Um, but we are in, um, we do have an absence of phase three data for this um, interesting therapeutic modality. Let's move on. Um, we talked about the therapeutic and pivotal clinical trials for anti-angiogenesis therapy. Then we talked about intraperitoneal therapy. Let's talk about weekly dose dense paclitaxel. The Japanese gynecologic oncology group um, has published in the Lancet in 2009. Um, their survival results showing significant improvement in overall survival using a weekly dose-dense schedule. It's thought that giving paclitaxel weekly increases its or takes advantage of its anti-angiogenic properties, which may manifest with a weekly dose-dense schedule. For those of you who remember, we typically give paclitaxel every um, 21 days at 175 milligrams per square meter. But when given weekly, it's given at 80 milligrams per square meter. So you get a total dose for one cycle of 240 milligrams, which is 75 milligrams more, um, or at 65 milligrams more than the week, the, excuse me, than the Q3 week 175 milligrams per square meter body surface area dose. Um, Dr. Katsumata recently updated their um, survival data from this um, pivotal clinical trial, and the survival data is um, just remarkable. 
However, GOG-262 tried to recapitulate this um, the Japanese study in Western patients, and it was a negative study. There are some uh, interesting, uh, interesting uh, points about GOG-262. In this study, the use of bevacizumab was optional. Now, again, this, these are newly diagnosed patients with advanced disease. This trial was opened up um, before we would find out that um, Genentech would not pursue a FDA label for bevacizumab in the frontline newly diagnosed ovarian cancer space. And so we had thought um, that by the time 262 was mature, that bevacizumab would be approved for frontline. And so we thought in this trial it was important to um, give physicians the option to use bevacizumab. Well, 80% of the physicians um, on 262 talked to their patients and agreed to use bevacizumab. 20% did not. Again, the trial as a whole looking at the entire study population was negative in that weekly dose dense paclitaxel did not improve survival, but although the, for the 80% of patients um, when doing subgroup analyses, the 80% 80 80 of patients who received bevacizumab, again, the study was negative, but when you look at the 20% who didn't receive BEV, the trial was positive. So the problem, though, is that the use of bevacizumab was not randomized. The analyses looking at these subgroups were not pre-planned, so they're really exploratory. However, it's interesting that it, there's two hypotheses that are competing. Either weekly dose dense paclitaxel really does not work in Western populations as it does in the Japanese, and there may be reasons for that. There's some evidence from the breast cancer literature that um, Asian patients may metabolize paclitaxel different than Western patients, but also it's possible that two antiangiogenic agents, the dose dense paclitaxel plus bevacizumab, may interfere with each other. In any event, the paper's under review. It was presented at the ESGO meeting in Liverpool back in 2013. <clears throat> now let's move towards PARP inhibitors. PARP inhibitors are um, exciting, uh, and they have applications beyond BRCA-positive patients. So Olaparib is um, this, the drug that has recently gained um, US FDA approval. In the study 19, um, led by Professor Lederman from the UK, it was studies as a maintenance therapy. Now, Olaparib um, got approved in the European Union for maintenance therapy uh, based on study 19. However, when they, um, AstraZeneca went to the United States FDA to get it approved as a maintenance therapy, and ODAC was convened, and for those of you who don't know, ODAC is the Oncology Drugs Advisory Committee, and these, uh, the ODAC voted 9 to 2 against approving Olaparib as a maintenance therapy. And so the um, PRODUFA date, the Prescription uh, the Drug Users Act date, which was in October, um, which is when the FDA was going to make a ruling on it, would they take um, ODAC's uh, recommendations into consideration, ended up being moved three months into the future. And the reason was is that AstraZeneca then started sending in data from study 42, which you can see down below. Now, study 42 was a prospective study looking at a lap rib for fourth line therapy and beyond in patients with ovarian cancer. Study 42 also included um, patients with breast cancer, uh, castration-resistant prostate cancer, as well as pancreatic cancer. But based on study 42, uh, the PDUFA date in the, for the US FDA was moved, and ultimately the US FDA approved Olaparib as a monotherapy for patients with germline BRCA mutations who had received three prior regimens. So <clears throat> we did get an approval. Um, interestingly, it's not um, the same approval that the EMA approved. Uh, which is for maintenance therapy, but we did get it for fourth line and beyond. Now, what's going on um, in terms of uh, studying a lap rib? Well, study 19 was a phase two randomized study. 
So SOLO1 is the successor to study 19 in this phase 3 randomized trial um, that is looking at Olaparib as a maintenance drug. For platinum sensitive recurrence, uh, Dr. Amit Oza um, from Canada, a fellow um, Indian, had done study 41, which was studying Olaparib in combination with chemotherapy for platinum sensitive recurrence. Phase, it was a randomized phase 2, and it's now being studied in SOLO2. And then, of course, we have study 42. Rucaparib is uh, another PARP inhibitor, and it was studied in platinum-sensitive patients and presented at ASCO. This was the Aerial 2 study. This um, was probably practice-changing because with Aerial 2, we are recognizing that it's not just going to be BRCA mutation carriers that are going to be able to respond to PARP inhibitors, but probably there's at least nine other genes that um, result in homologous deficiency, uh, homologous recombination deficiencies in patients. And so based on Ariel 2 presented at ASCO this year, Rucaparib was given breakthrough therapy designation by the US FDA, meaning that while it's not yet approved um, in the United States, um, the FDA has signaled that they are willing to work with the sponsor in order to help develop the um, correct trials to help um, best position it for regulatory approval. Niraparib is another drug that's um, currently being studied in the platinum sensitive population. It's a PARP inhibitor and the NOVA trial, phase 3 randomized trial, close to approval early in 2015. And finally, filipirib is being studied by the GOG in their partner study for newly diagnosed patients. This study just opened. Filipirib is being studied in frontline patients, and this schema is very similar, if not identical, to the schema of the study of bevacizumab in GOG 218. Specifically, the three arms of the study are carboplatin, paclitaxel, plus placebo, followed by maintenance placebo, versus carboplatin, paclitaxel, filipirib, followed by maintenance placebo, versus carboplatin, paclitaxel, filipirib throughout. So that has um, just been launched. The first patient was dosed maybe a month ago. Um, I'm not sure what center it was that, that, that patient came from, but this is also going to be exciting. So PARP inhibitors will have applications beyond patients that are just BRCA positive, and so um, we should follow this work very carefully. What about chemotherapy-free doublets? As we um, move further and further beyond the um, into targeted agent therapy, we've um, developed some several doublets: olaparib plus sidirinib. So olaparib again, a PARP inhibitor plus the oral tyrosine kinase inhibitor sidirinib. This sidirinib um, uh, inactivates VEGF receptor 1, 2, and 3, and this um, was studied by Liu and colleagues and published in the JCO in 2014. Another chemotherapy-free doublet takes advantage of anti-angiogenesis and anti-vascular therapy, bevacizumab plus phosphatabulin. This was GOG86I um, presented by Dr. Monk, um, my mentor. Um, at the IGCS meeting in 2014 in Melbourne, Australia. The manuscript is nearly completed. It's currently undergoing um, review by the GOG publication subcommittee, but phosphatabulum is a vascular disrupting agent which attacks existing vasculature. Bevacizumab prevents new vasculature from forming, so the end result is a dual um, antivascular attack on angiogenesis in existing blood vessels to prune back the existing vasculature. Very exciting. In terms of translational science in ovarian cancer, of course we got the Gorley data presented at ASCO in 2014 in which he identified immune and proangiogenic subgroups characterized by um, I think a gene signature of approximately 92 genes. He validated his work um, using the ICON-7 specimens and basically showed that patients with an immune group profile were not um, ones that responded to bevacizumab, whereas with the proangiogenic subgroups, there was a trend towards 
improve progression-free survival with the inclusion of bevacizumab in ICON-7. Uh, Mike Beer at, um, from the GOG, uh, using GOG-218 specimens, presented this year at ASCO, um, demonstrated significantly improved PFS and OS using um, CD31 microvessel density analysis, as well as um, some important um, findings looking at VEGFA isoform um, transcripts for overall survival. And then, of course, in, as I mentioned, Arial 2 was practice breaking and our practice changing and um, led to US FDA breakthrough therapy designation for Recaprib and really identified the homologous recombinant recombination deficiency molecular subgroups. Um, this is all important because most of these trials, if not all of them, except for maybe the um, PARP inhibitor trials, they were not being studied in enriched patient populations. Um, it was just really all comers, but these studies indicate that the, the field of ovarian cancer is moving towards a biomarker enriched field, whereas patients with specific biomarkers will have their therapy selected and guided based on that. So let's end with um, just a couple of the studies that, a, a little more detail of the studies that led to drugs for the first time in eight years. Um, we finally had some drugs approved. So the Aurelia study was looking at patients with platinum-resistant ovarian cancer. Chemotherapy was by physician's choice, but they had to use either weekly paclitaxel, um, uh, topotecan, there were two schedules permitted, 4 milligrams per square meter, 30 minutes, day 1, day 8, day 15, or 1.25 milligrams per square meter, days 1 through 5, or monthly pegylated um, liposomal doxorubicin. This was, the randomization was to uh, bevacizumab or not, and the um, dose of bevacizumab was 10 milligrams per kilogram every two weeks until progression, except when combined with um, week, every three-week topotecan, the dose of bevacizumab was 15 milligrams per kilogram. You can see here that uh, progression-free survival was significantly improved, just like the other seven anti-angiogenesis studies in ovarian cancer. Um, the primary endpoint had been met, but this is the only trial that led to regulatory approval of bevacizumab in the United States. You can see that the median PFS is 6.7 months in the BEV arm versus 3.4 months. Again, these numbers are small because this is the platinum-resistant group. The hazard of death um, was reduced by 52% uh, uh, with a hazard ratio of 0 0.48. The confidence interval does not include one, and the p-value is highly significant. So this is what the NCCN, the National Comprehensive Cancer Network Guideline Recommendations for Bevacizumab and Platinum-Resistant Ovarian Cancers indicate. Category 2A for all three of the chemo regimens studied in Aurelia. Um, so patients cannot have previously received Bevacizumab, and of course, um, because of the concerns for gastrointestinal perforation, um, the use of um, any of these regimens is contraindicated at those patients that are at significant risk for GI perforation. So in this slide here, we've got recommended therapies for patients with platinum-sensitive versus platinum-resistant disease. Um, you can see there's a lot of carboplatin as well as cisplatin, uh, but as we know, the platinum drugs can be combined with uh, not only paclitaxel, but also gemcitabine and docesaxel, as well as um, pegylated liposomal doxorubicin, and that, of course, is based on the Calypso study. Targeted therapy for platinum-sensitive disease includes bevacizumab and elaparib. In platinum-resistant disease, again, um, bevacizumab and elaparib are present. I want to point out these are guidelines. Um, we do not have regulatory approval to use bevacizumab in the platinum-sensitive setting. Here's the slide that illustrates the disconnect between the European Medicines Agency and the US FDA with respect to the bevacizumab-based um, indications in ovarian cancer. BME has approved it for frontline maintenance therapy, platinum-resistant recurrent disease, and platinum-sensitive recurrent disease. In the US, we only have an approval for platinum-resistant recurrence. 
single agent trials, as I showed you, we talked about PARP inhibitors, um, and we talked about specifically um, synthetic lethality in terms of in the maintenance um, area, which is the Lederman study on the right. But also there's um, evidence um, in the fourth line space and beyond, which is what we got PARP inhibitors approved for in the United States, so Laparib specifically. This is the Kaufman study. This was study 42, which um, is the, contains the data that the uh, AstraZeneca, the sponsor, submitted to the FDA when the ODAC voted against approving the Laparib. Now, the, um, you can see here, if you read the abstract, that the tumor response rate was 31.1% for um, patients in fourth-line therapy for ovarian cancer, but actually, if you look at the uh, package insert for Olaparib um, that was approved by the US FDA, they, it, it indicates that the response rate was 34%. That was for the subgroup of patients that had measurable disease by resist. So um, that's very exciting because we really don't have drugs that uh, in the recurrent setting that have response rates really above 20%. So, but Olaparib is a monotherapy for fourth line and beyond, 34% um, overall response rate amongst those with measurable disease. Um, and you can see this here again, 31% um, is what the paper shows for ovarian cancer. This is the first column. But again, as I indicated, for the subgroup of patients with uh, measurable disease, the response rate was 34%. <clears throat> as I said, the Olaparib FDA label is for fourth line and beyond and it's for patients with germline uh, BRCA mutations only. Uh, the FDA indication is 400 milligrams orally, BID, again, three or more lines of prior therapy, and BRCA analysis um, positive, or BRCA analysis patients, uh, patients studied with BRCA, the BRCA analysis um, homologous recombination deficiency test that was also approved as a companion diagnostic by the FDA when they approved Olaparib. Um, only those patients are eligible for reimbursement by Medicare with um, germline BRCA mutations. Again, we have a disconnect between the European Medicine Agency and the FDA. Again, the EMA has approved um, uh, Olaparib as a maintenance therapy for platinum-sensitive patients. And they're approving it for patients that not only have germline BRCA mutations, but also somatic mutations, which means mutations in the tumor. The FDA, of course, has, as I said um, several times, has only approved it <clears throat> in patients with a BRCA germline mutation as a fourth line and beyond monotherapy. So I thought we could end with a case, and you can um, submit your responses to me. Hopefully, I'll be able to see them. This is a case of a patient with platinum-resistant ovarian cancer, 59-year-old Caucasian school teacher. We can make her Indian, since we are in India right now. Or you're in India. I wish I was in India, but I'm here. In any event, um, stage 3C high-grade serous cancer. Um, she was operated on um, maximally with an optimal cytoreductive outcome with residual disease only 5 millimeters. She got intraperitoneal chemotherapy, <clears throat> but unfortunately, within five months of treatment, her CA125 rose to 175, and she had reaccumulated ascites. Her medical history is noteworthy for hypertension, treated with a diuretic. Mother has a history of breast cancer. Key questions. How are we going to treat her? What's the chemotherapy backbone that's going to be used? And um, should we use bevacizumab? Should she undergo BRCA testing? So why don't you think about that? And if we can turn this, my, get rid of my screen, we can um, see what people's responses are. Chris, uh, Chris uh, you talked about uh, basic uh, differentiation of platinum sensitive and platinum resistant. I was wondering what is the molecular basis for this stratification? Yeah, there really isn't. Um, it's a there. It's a clinical guideline, um, but we have not really um, identified any um, 
specific molecular um, aberration that describes those patients specifically in terms of platinum sensitivity, platinum resistance. There are many molecules involved in um, platinum, the acquired resistance, the development of acquired resistance to platinum and even inherent resistance to platinum compounds. For example, there are molecules that can, the, the cell makes that excise the platinum DNA adducts, but the um, formal stratification of these uh, molecules and their activity to act within six months or beyond six months, um, there is no data on that and the, it's just really an arbitrary designation that we've created. Um, and doesn't really have any actual basis. But clinically, we see that there are patients that do not respond to platinum-based therapy and patients who relapse very quickly. And so we don't, uh, we don't yet understand who, what, what's wrong, what's the problem with these patients. I mean, part of us think that um, early relapse is a surrogate for bad surgery, meaning that if you can get the, or not bad surgery, that, that's probably not fair to say, but um, a surgery in which the outcome was not what we wanted because based on tumor biology mainly, not necessarily surgical skill, but tumor biology, either the disease is resectable or it isn't. And certainly, you, if you can resect the majority of the disease, if not all the visible disease, the relapse is usually going to be later. So we haven't really figured it out yet. Uh, there's another question I have here. Yeah. When your, your involvement mainly I see is in uh, advanced disease, uh, your interest is in that, whether it is CA cervix or it is uh, uh, ovarian cancer. Yes. Uh, uh, when you talk of survival uh, in terms of, has that been adjusted to the quality of life? Because yeah, well, when these guys are on chemotherapeutic combinations, uh, at least I have seen that uh, that discount is very important to see that if you give 34 or 35 months of mean survival advantage, uh, has it been adjusted for uh, quality of life? Not necessarily adjusted, but for example, in GOG 218, there is a quality of life um, component to this trial. And so, um, in GOG218, quality of life did not significantly deteriorate amongst patients receiving bevacizumab. So we are do your question is a very important one, and we are trying our best to address quality of life in um, these studies. And so, unfortunately, the majority of these studies, or many of the ones at least performed, um, you know, maybe more than five years ago did not have quality of life included, but moving forward, um, I think that every study does have a quality of life component, especially if it's a phase three study, and so we're trying to do a better job with evaluating that. I think uh, uh, I, I, I would like to know the closing remark from you. If you watch through your crystal ball with all your experience, where do we see us with the management of uh, ovarian cancer in next five years? Yeah, I think ovarian cancer in the next five years, it's really going to be about biomarkers. We're going to be using a patient's uh, molecular phenotype as interrogated um, by the tumor to guide therapy. So it's going to be a biomarker enriched world. It's going to be all about different combinations and it's going to be about translational science. I think those three areas are, represent the future of um, management of this disease. Biomarkers, novel combinations, including chemotherapy-free combinations, as I gave, provided two examples, and, of course, more translational science. Thank you very much. I think I hand over. I really enjoyed your talk, and I'm sure so would be our viewers. Hand it back to Dave. Dr. Tuari, thanks so much. I know it was terribly early for you in the morning out there in California. Okay. And I want to thank all of our attendees from around the world that joined us today. Thank you again. And that we're going to say goodbye. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much.